was born in privilege, which wasn't necessarily the blessing you might think it is, because I didn't learn properly about right. I didn't understand what was right, necessarily, and I didn't understand how I fit into that. All I understood for myself was I was massively obliged because I had all this great stuff and great opportunities given to me, great education, lots of things around me. But I lived in a world where generosity was an excuse for someone to exploit you, and they saw it as weakness. And I lived in a world where if you didn't understand how to manipulate people, you were subject to a brutality that was couched in very, very polite ways. So I left that world and I said, I'm going to come to Canada. I'm going to make something better for myself. I'm going to change my location. And what I discovered was I brought me with me. <laughs> and I found out that you can change the scenery, but it doesn't change the play. So I went back to the habits of my life and I discovered that, well, you know when you're young people tell you you're the master of your fate, you're the captain of your soul, which is a quote from Mr. Henley. It's not true. But when we're young, when we're nine or ten years old, that's what we think. We're sailing off on this incredible adventure and life is everything you want it to be. You can be an astronaut, you can be a movie star, you can train dogs, you can do whatever you want to. And the more we see on TV, the more we can think what we can do. And somehow, those dreams just drift away. And at some point in time, we are no longer living. We've sunk into an existence instead of a life. I've done that. And when you sink into an existence instead of a life, your thoughts your attitudes, even what you conceive as right or wrong is more the sum total or the mirror of the spirit of the people around you than they belong to a reasoning person. You are no longer a person. I've become circumstances breathing. Whether I like shag carpet or this car or that movie or that music group or that style of dress, is more a reflection or a mirror of what is going on in my life rather than my life, my thoughts. I am just a reflection. I am circumstances breathing. And we settle. Well, you know how it is. The 17-year-old girl gets phoned up and her friends say, come into the movie. And she says, yeah, I'd love to come to the movie. What are we seeing? And they say, the latest James Bond. And she's like, yeah, cool. They say, hey, we've all got boyfriends and I know you don't have one right now, but can you just bring someone so we're not you know, out of the group? Sure. So you phone up Bob, and you say to Bob, hey, Bob, can you come to the movie? And Bob says, yes. Oh, no, I can't. Not tonight. I promised my mom I'd help my sister move. OK. Jason, I'd like him to. So I phone up Jason, and Jason says, I'd love to come with you, but I've got to study. I've got an exam. Oh, M. I know him. We'll call him M. So I phone up M, and M says, yeah, I'll come. So you go with him. And you know what M's like? He's the guy, the popcorn all over the floor. He's the guy who spills the drink. He's the guy who's so busy asking you what happened because he doesn't understand anything in a James Bond movie. He, he says, what's going on? And by the time you've explained it to him, and the person behind you hates you, and the person in front of you hates you, and you don't know what's going on either. <laughs> so why do you marry him? But that's what we do. You see, when we have all these goals and dreams about what we are going to be, and they're hiring down at the local whatever when you've finally graduated or whatever you've done, and you go down there and you get a job because you need the money. And 25 years later, what are you saying to yourself? You settled. You let circumstances decide what you were doing with your life. Every precious second, and you've only got about 2 billion of them, or about 25,000 days. But you wasted them settling. And there's reasons for that. We all have reasons for why we do things. Maybe you didn't even, weren't even aware that your life was something to be crafted and built, that you had to be the architect of a life. Maybe that was the reason. Maybe your reason was you thought, you know what, I want to do something, and you tried it, and you failed. You wanted to change the world in some area, and you tried it, and you failed, and you said, I can't do it. I'm a failure. I am doomed to failure. Maybe you had no sense of entitlement. Yes, someone can win, but not me. 
Maybe one time you did something good and you realized that other people around you that you thought and trusted were your friends or your family were insulted or offended by your success and so you shrank to make them more comfortable. Or maybe you just simply didn't know what was possible for you. I don't know your reasons. All I know is those reasons were mine. I felt I had no rights. I felt that I was just living by grace of someone else's pleasure. And also, no matter, even if someone told me I was a swan, I looked in a mirror and I saw a duck. So I don't know what your reasons are, but I called them reasons and really they were excuses. And I had them, but I was prepared to justify an existence of compliance and being a circumstance because I didn't know how to break out of that and become a person. Stephen Covey says, our ultimate freedom is the right to decide what we will allow to affect us. And when I was younger, people would say to you, you can get what you want if you work hard enough. You've ever heard that? It's not true. You and I know it's not true, and that's why we don't get what we want. I mean, none of us want to die, and that's eventually what you're going to get. What you can get is you can become who you want to become if you make choices about what you're allowed, going to allow to affect you. And the only way that happens is if you are prepared to give up some of that existence you have and get a life. And the only way we can get a life if we understand who our boss actually is. It took me a while. <laughs> But finally, it dawned on me. My boss is my future me. It's the person who five years from now is going to say, good job, girl. I'm glad you finally stopped eating those cookies and getting yourself exercising, because now we've got a better body to live in. Or good job, you. I'm glad you finally decided to give up some of that existence, practice the guitar, so now you can enjoy playing duets with David. <laughs> good job, person. You gave up an existence, you got a life, and now we've got something better. And once I realized who my boss was, what a difference in my life. Because instead of thinking I'm being selfish or unreasonable to want something better for myself, I realized I owed it to the future me. And not just the future me, but I owed it to my children and the generations I could be with to live instead of exist. You ask the average nine-year-old, what do you want to be when you grow up? And they're never going to tell you they want to be broke, overweight, unfit, unhappy, hating a job they hate, hoping for something better, and hoping that one day they get the right numbers on Lotto 649. <laughs> you know, it's like this woman, she's walking down along the riverbank and she hears screaming and she runs over and grabs a kid out of the river just before he drowns and she says to him, how did you come to fall in? And he says, I didn't come to fall in. I came to fish. <laughs> you see, we don't go through life to look back and think, what happened? But that's what happens to so many of us. One day I looked at this body and said, what did you do to you? And oh yeah, I could blame things. Because I've been broken hearted. And I've been crying, and I've been devastated. And there was times when I sat beside my son, and they said he was going to die. I thought, I'm not going to keep breathing. And there was times when after I was in the hospital, after I had a car accident, I thought, this is it. This is all I can ever become. And I swear, the chocolate bars attacked me during the night. <laughs> but at some point in time, I had to realize, not blame, not that paralyzing brain that says, you are useless, you failed again, you can't win, but that blame that says you are responsible for your life. It's your life. You wouldn't let someone else do to them what you are prepared to do to you, so why are you doing it? Get control. And it was such a, duh, like why? Why do we let ourselves be puppets to something else? Why do we prepare to, for the moment, gratification, give up a life for the future? And once I realized that, I realized I needed more help with this. 
I needed to understand better what I could control. Because you know what? Instead of being boat sailing off to this great future, most of us are bottles, bobbing around in the surface and letting the winds and waves travel us to unwanted and unlooked for and often very unfriendly shores. And the message is in those bottles. Who cares? They're not our words anyway. They're not our thoughts. And I decided I want to be a boat. Now, a boat's still subject to the same wind and waves, but at least you're heading in a direction where you want to go and you've got a much better chance of getting there. So I had to make a decision about what I could control. And there's only three things I've discovered, and they're not my thoughts. Someone else gave them to me about what I could control. I can control my belief system. I can decide to believe that I can win or I can decide to believe that I'm doomed to fail. I can control my attitude and I can control my activity. And what a gift that is to know that those things I can control. So now, I remind myself, I can control my belief system. And I try to say to myself, if this belief is good for you, it has to be good for everyone else. So if you think you can only fail, you're saying everyone else only has the right to fail. If you think you're a duck, then there ain't no geese out there or swans. So let's get over being a duck. So once I got my belief system in the right place, then I looked at my attitude and realized that my attitude didn't serve me all the time. So I decided I'm going to be happy. I'm going to be happy if my son's in the hospital. I'm going to be happy if I'm in the hospital. As long as I'm breathing, I'm going to be happy. Now, this not always happens. Don't ask my family what happens sometimes. But as a general rule, I work at being happy and grateful because gratitude is the oil that keeps relationships healthy. And so I'm so grateful for you. I get a chance to talk to you. What a privilege that is. And I think about how so many people have done so many things to put me on this platform today. Thank you. I'm grateful. Now, once I looked at those things, attitude-wise, then I had to look at my activity because so often we work at the wrong things. And I've actually, one of the great privileges of my life is I now work with a company that encourages me and has actually taught me the five things I'm going to share with you. The recipe for the right activity, no matter what job you have. Number one, you need to have goals. You need to know where your ship is going. And if you're a boat, you need to get a rudder and an engine. And if you're a bottle, you need to get a rudder and an engine so you can become a boat. And you need to be heading in a direction. So you need some goals. And it might take you a while to figure out what you want in life, who you want to become. So we need to be a boat with goals. Then we need to read those goals every day because just like a ship is continually taking heading readings and figuring out how the winds and the rain and everything has affected it, we need to know where we're going if we're in the right direction. So we read our goals to remind ourselves. Then we need to pre-plan our day. Because if we don't pre-plan our day, life just happens to us. And we start doing the immediate instead of the important. And we don't get to where we want to go. So goals, pre-plan your day. Then you need to find some sort of system of accountability. Hopefully, you have someone in your life you can be accountable to. If you don't, be accountable to yourself. And make sure that every day, and this is the fourth one, you do something to move forward to that goal. So let's say you're doing a job now you hate and you want to do something different, you can figure out how you can move towards that and every day do one little thing, even 10 minutes or five minutes worth, to help you get to where you want to go. Because we are so fragile in our thinking and so easily influenced by everything else, we need to find other boats who have learned more than us to encourage us. And one of the ways that happens in the sea world is they go in convoys when there's dangers. And that's one of the blessings I've had and you can have too. The library is full of books from good people. People like Dr. Covey and John Maxwell and Mark Malcolm Gladwell. We need to read good books every day, at least 10 pages, or listen to them. We need to take in information so we will not just let our lives drift away. Those 25,000 plus very, very precious days. Your life is too precious to be in existence. We can't change the world, but we can change me, and that can change everything. 
we can be committed to getting our children and our children's children not to learn the facts of life, but to learn the concept that life has to be built. We have to be the architects of our life. We have to create something that we want to live in. It's not going to happen by accident. We were born bottles. Someone carried us around. We have to become boats driving through whatever life hands us and making sure that we're living it. So let's make a commitment to do that. Let's make a commitment to be people and not just circumstances breathing. Let's make a commitment to celebrate life by living it, by the joy of it all, and even the failure of it. Because I had to learn that failure was not what I was addicted to. Failure was not here and success there, and I always seemed to choose failure somehow. I had to learn that failure was here and success was beyond it. Just like the only way a child learns to walk is by falling, I had to realize that when I failed, it was one step closer to success. So here I am, giving a TEDx talk. And I hope it was a little bit of value, but I didn't do it for you. I did it for me. Because this is my life, and I'm living it. Little boat me. <laughs>